Good morning. We are glad that you are here with us today as we start off another week together here. Oops, my bad, Rodney. There we go. As we start off another week, we're thankful for that. We're thankful that we serve a God who is still rolling stones in our lives, who's still stepping into our places and putting things back together and redeeming things. We're thankful for that, and it's a good reason for us to sing. A few things before we get into your chance to share what you're thankful for. Uh, if you're here today, there are these yellow cards that are in front of you. If you're a guest with us, if you would just take a moment to fill these out and drop it in. Just want to follow up to see how we can best uh, go through life with you, if that's just through prayer support, if there's other ways. Uh, make connections with you. Uh, that would be wonderful. This is your home. This is your church home. Feel free to fill one of these out also if you have a request or, or things that are going on in life that you would like for us to either pray about or if you need a phone call or visitation for those things. Great opportunities for you to do that as well. I want to point your attention to a few other things that are a little new for us as we uh, move into this indoor area. Over here is a new section for us and what we have is our prayer board wall, our interactive prayer wall. If you have a specific request, you can put that up there. Also, uh, you can give us the praise reports, which are good too for us. That's over there in this section. Also over here, you're gonna find a few things. There's a blue piece of paper. If you haven't filled out a gifts inventory uh, yet, we would love for you to fill one of those out so we can continually look for ways to plug in uh, to life around here. This thing is driving me absolutely crazy today. There we go. Uh, for that. So that will be over there also. Uh, and we're kind of transitioning some things over here. You'll see Operation Christmas Child too. But then the last thing I want to give you a, an opportunity for is uh, the next membership class is coming up. November 1st is when it's starting. It's a four week uh, class, four Sundays. Happens before service about 9 o'clock. We start 8 30 ish. If you're interested in that, you can uh, sign up over here. And that's going to again start November 1st through the 22nd. That being said, all those things. I'm thankful to be back. It was great to be away. I tuned in last week virtually with uh, all of you at home. Welcome to you who are watching either on Facebook or on YouTube or our website. We're glad that you're able to worship with us also. Uh, but it's good to be back. It's good to be together. And I would love to hear what you're thankful for. Does anyone today have anything that you're thankful for that you would like to praise God for? Anyone? Nice weather this past week so we could have yard work. It was great weather that we had, wasn't it? Yesterday was uh, did not feel like the middle of October, but that uh, was absolutely beautiful. Wonderful weather, for sure. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Thank you for the worship team. What a way to start. Yes, we're thankful for the, our worship team and how they are gifted in so many ways to lead us into worship on a variety of different uh, styles and, and ways that we do it. Thank you for all your hard work and your dedication and using your gifts for the Lord. We're worthy of our praise. Yes. Yes, I've got a congregational meeting also in a variety of ways. We're thankful for Sonia and her efforts to make sure that we're aware of those things. Uh, just, I, you're going to hear this about four different ways because one of the ongoing jokes for us in our staff meeting is I have a notorious uh, tendency to forget some things consistently. Like announcing that the annual, or not the annual, see, the quarterly meeting will be next Sunday following the service uh, on the 18th. If you are uh, interested, if you're a member, or if you're just curious of what's going on, we'll have a congregational quarterly meeting uh, following the service next week where we uh, have some excited opportunities to think about next year's leadership, the nominating team, and uh, positions that, for boards and things like that when we talk about at that point, too. So I remembered. Thank you for all those. I had a team of people to remind me some of these things were there, too. Anyone else? Something you're thankful for? I'm thankful. We are thankful, Karen and Bruce, that you guys are here today, uh, that you went through what you did, and that you're back with us. It is wonderful. Thank you for that. Who else? Well, the thing that I'm most thankful for as I come in today is uh, the creativity of God. As you look around, you see uh, the remnants of a master painter, uh, the most creative entity that's ever been known. And uh, as we walked and drove up last weekend uh, or Monday to Hopper, uh, <laughs> Hopper. Copper Harbor uh, to see all that they are. Just the beauty of the colors is so cool. And it's a reminder that, that creation has a creator. And, and he's revealed to us through that. And that's what we come to worship today. I invite you to stand with me as we pray and we get ready to continue our time in the worship this morning. I, I know that you come in here with not just yourself, but things have followed you. This past week, maybe you had situations come up, things that are on your mind, things that are heavy on your hearts, uh, that want your attention that buy for a position. And I know that some of us have things this next week that we're uh, facing that are not going to be easy. But while we're here, we have this unique opportunity to worship together, to be challenged by God's Word together, to be 
present together in, in, the, in the just the community of saints that we have here. And we want to put our focus on Christ. Would you bow your heads? As we choose to point our hearts toward Him. As we come and we lay down the things that we bring in and we soften our hearts and open our ears and we pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you're our Father, that you've united us through your love and your work. And God, because of that, we pray that your kingdom will come and your will be done. We, we thank you that you love us because you know us and see us, yet you still choose us. God, we thank you for that. We worship that. And I pray that you would show us how you've uh, equipped us to be a part of your work here. I pray that you would give us a spirit of unity as we serve and we go through life together here. And I pray that this would be honoring to you. We give you this time. Pray it in your name. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you today, Lord, uh, for the opportunity to come to worship, and that we have a place we can do that, Lord. But remember, we can worship everywhere we go. Uh, to be with us as we worship today, Lord. Uh, help us to let us be led by you, to not be led by the world, to not be led by our friends, even our family or ourselves, Lord, but to be led by you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
that are happening right now in two places, Facebook and YouTube, and I'm sitting right behind this camera right here, and I'm watching it. There's about 30 people that are, are joining us online there. I don't know how many are on our, our stream for YouTube, but as a reminder to us that we, as a church, we are unified, that we are all worshiping together. So everyone everyone, wave to the, the, the streaming folks, you know, say hi, you know, to them, but we are all one church, and that is an amazing, amazing thing that we can come together and worship together as one church, whether you're online or you're here in person, it doesn't matter, but we are all one church. So as we worship this morning, as we continue to worship, remember that. Um, one more thing, uh, at the end of the month, on the 31st, we are going to host a trunk or treat here, whether it's raining, whether it's a blizzard, whether there's six feet of snow, whether there's meteors falling from the sky, it doesn't matter, we're going to host a trip or treat outside because I like giving away free candy. So uh, we're going to do that, but I need help doing that. I need uh, people to volunteer to decorate their car, their truck, their covered wagon. I, I, I don't care what, whatever you've got, your tractor. Out in the parking lot, we're going to be outside. We're going to have all the cars socially distanced. You can give candy with like a giant 10 foot pole if you want. Doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, I need people to volunteer and to be part of that and to decorate and to bring joy and to bring the love of Christ to people in our community. So if you want to do that, uh, come uh, after the service, talk to me, and uh, I'll give you the, the details for that. Okay? So uh, let's go ahead and continue. I know we have a few kids here, so I'm going to invite our, our kids forward. Come on forward. I have a special message for you this morning. And uh, come on up, and you can sit up here on the stairs. So there you are. Come on. Let's go. There's some more up there. It's going to take them a while to get here. Come on forward. You're going to like this one. This is cool. Hey, have a seat right there. Right there. Come on forward. How are you? Good. It's doing okay? Good? Good. Hi. Good morning. How are you doing? So, so I have a dilemma. Do you guys know what a dilemma is? It's a problem. 
It's something that I have to figure out a solution to, and I'm glad you're here this morning because you can help me do that. Okay, you guys, you, you're going to help me do this? Okay, all right. So, so I said earlier I like giving away free candy, and I have one last. I love Halloween. Do you guys love Halloween? I love Halloween because, not because of the costumes or the decoration. I love it because my office somehow fills up with bags of candy every year, and it's really great, all right, because I eat half of it. All right, so uh, I have this one last piece of candy. Do you guys like Smarties? I love Smarties. Smarties are really good, right? This one last piece of candy, and I have to decide who I'm going to give it to. Okay, so you, you guys are going to help me do this. Okay, so I have, I have two people in mind that I think deserve it, okay? But you're going to have to help me do this. So, like, the first one is, is my daughter, Caitlin. And she's right there. Wave, Caitlin. How are you, you doing? It's, it's Caitlin, okay? It's Caitlin. And the second person is, is Ben. Now, you guys know Ben. Ben is the leader of our worship up here. He, he's playing guitar up here all the time, okay? Now, here's the thing. Caitlin's my daughter. So... Maybe I should give it to her. But Ben is a good friend of mine. Maybe I should give it to him. What do you guys think? Do you have an opinion? What do you think? Who, who should I give it to? No idea? <laughs> this isn't helping. Split it? I can't split it. I mean, that's very equitable and fair, and, and that's nice of you. But but I can't split this one, one piece of candy. It's got to go to somebody. Your wife. Okay. My wife, <laughs> wow, who said that? You're her new best friend. All right, so, well, let's see. Hold on a sec. Well, how about we do this based on, like, merits, like how good they are? And, and my, my daughter, she gets pretty good grades, right? She's, uh, she's a nice person. Ben, he, he fixes roofs all around the city. He's, he's a very good person. I, I like him, too. Let's see. Uh, what about how about somebody who's been a Christian the longest? <gasps> That'll work, right? Right? Hey, do you have an idea? Well, I could, I should give it to God. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get there. I don't know. All right. Okay. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. She's what? Fourteen? I don't even know how old her daughter is. Right? Fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen. She she's roughly somebody do math for me. Roughly Christian. I think maybe. 11 years, 10 years, something like that. Okay. Ben, when, when did you become a Christian? When I was about 20. About 20, so 26 years. 26 years. Okay, so Ben really should get it because he's been a Christian long time, right? <laughs> ben, yeah, Ben's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I give it to Ben, he, he deserves it, right? That doesn't seem fair, right? Here, I mean, it's candy. Shouldn't, shouldn't I both get it? Right? Hmm. Well, how about this? How about I give everybody candy, and we'll just call it good. All right? So there's candy for you. There's candy for you. There's candy for you. There's candy for Ben. There's candy for Caitlin. All right. So you know, everyone gets candy, right? Candy. Oh, look. Hey. <laughs> Candy for me. Awesome. All right. So, you know, here's the thing. You know, God is kind of like this, where, you know, it doesn't matter when you became a Christian or how long you've known or loved Jesus, right? You could be a, a person who's 60 years old and just come to Christ and just know Jesus. Or you could be a, how old are you? How old are you? Seven. seven. You could be a seven-year-old and love Jesus. I did. Look, bonus candy. Sweet. You could be a seven-year-old and love Jesus, and it's just as good. You know, God gives us salvation. He gives us grace. No matter how old you are, how long you've been a Christian, it doesn't really matter because the gift of grace is a free gift to everyone who loves Jesus and loves God. Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome thing. So, hey, let's pray, and then I'll dismiss you guys when you guys have some children's church. Okay? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are our God. Thank you. That it doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter what we've done. That your grace, your salvation is a free gift. It's better than candy. It is a free gift that you give us. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, we ask blessings on this day.
pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. All right. You guys are dismissed for office right over there. See you guys later. Well, this morning, as we go to prayer, remember the free gift of salvation, the free gift of grace that God gives us. Better than candy. Better than everything. It's that free gift. So let's go to prayer now remembering that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our God. Thank you that you give us the free gift of grace. It doesn't matter how long we have known you, how short we have known you. It doesn't matter what we have done because your grace is the gift. Remind us of that day. But help us to share your gift of grace with the world around us. Help us to share your gift to those that we know, our neighbors, our friends, those that we meet. Help us to be bold to share your gospel message with the world. Lord, every day, help us to be your hands and feet, to be those people that love those that aren't like us. Help us to love those that maybe we disagree with. Lord, help us to love everyone as you love everyone. Lord, in all things, Lord, we lift up to you our struggles this week. We lift up our problems to you, our requests, our praises, our joys, all we lift to you. Lord, we pray for those that need your hand of healing this week. We lift it up to you. We lift those names that are on our hearts. Lord, we pray that you be in the details, that you are in control. Remind us of that. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for those that are the decision makers. Lord, we pray that they turn their faces towards you. Remind them that you are God. In all things, your will be done. Lord, we pray all of these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Stand with us again, please, as we worship. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let's just not worship with our mouths, but worship with our hearts as well.
So I'm reading scripture this morning from the book of Matthew, Matthew 20, 1 through 7. And it says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Well, it's good to be back together again as we uh, enter into another start to our week, another Lord's Day that we have the opportunity to be together uh, in person, live or at home, digitally, with whatever it is. We are thankful for that, uh, that God has provided so many ways for us to stay connected. Uh, a few things I would say, if you're one of our volunteer, connection volunteer people, uh, I encourage you to continually reach out to people that maybe you haven't seen, just to check up. I would encourage you, as, a, as family members of this body, to look around and say, who I haven't seen for a while, and, and check in on them, to see how they're doing, give them a word of encouragement. Uh, in this uncertain times, it goes a long way. A phone call, an email, uh, one of these things I've heard rumored to still happen is handwritten letter. Uh, that still could go in the mail. Those are phenomenal things that make differences to people. I would encourage you to, to be creative in the way that you reach out, uh, whatever that is, as we go through this really weird time where no one really knows what to do. So we do the things that we can, what's Christ-like and what's wise. Uh, this last week while I was away, I, I wouldn't really call it a vacation. We had a very productive time around our house as we get ready for winter and we go through all the things that it takes to wrap up a homestead. Uh, we put the garden away and we, uh, we get the chickens winterized and, and we start setting up all these structures thinking about spring because I like to think about the end of winter coming at some point soon. So spring is a good way for me to think about that going through this time. And, and I'm just thankful though. Uh, for all of us. I, I got to watch last week uh, at home. We, we had both YouTube <clears throat> and Facebook going on because I just wanted to see what it was like. It was neat to see the interactions there. So if you're at home, I encourage you to continually comment to one another, talk to each other, uh, stay connected as best we can. We're glad that you're with us and we're with you no matter what is coming. Uh, but we did a lot of other things that were busy and productive around the house while I was gone. But we do one thing every October. Around October 1st, as close as possible, we've done this for a few years now, we will put the kids in the car and we trek to Copper Harbor, right? I, I completely butchered that earlier, trying to say that word, but the Copper Harbor is where we go. We go up Rockway Mountain and we see all of the leaves and all of the splendor and Lake Superior is there. Uh, we went there this last Monday, uh, a week ago tomorrow. We worked our way up to the mountain and it is the windiest I ever remember it being. There was points where I was standing forward just so I didn't get knocked over. We found this little side on one part of the mountain and we sat down there with our kids. Now our kids don't mind the road trip because we packed up with all the good snacks. We had Oreos and, and veggie straws and all of this crunchy stuff. They look forward to it, but the long road trip can sometimes get long for all of us. So we try to find things to make it interesting. This year is a little different. This year, uh, over this last week, uh, since the last Sunday until uh, tomorrow, we have had with us one of our little buddies. Uh, you may have seen him be bopping around here from time to time. His mom had surgery uh, last weekend, so he's been at our house for a week. He's four years old, and I was quickly reminded that four-year-olds see the world a little bit differently. <laughs> they are engaged and energetic in ways that uh, maybe we have outgrown a little bit at our house, as our kids are now 11, 9, and 7, and they do things a little bit more self-sufficient. They're trained up in the way that they should go, sort of, as Harrison's anyway. And they're able. But they also just see the world differently. It doesn't take long when you're around a little ones to kind of get a sense of the awe that they have for the world. They're exploring things, things we take for granted that are known or unknown to them. So how do they figure it out? They talk, and they ask questions, and they do it a lot. A whole lot. I'm talking about constant, non-stop, from the time they wake up at 5.45 in the morning until the time they go to bed, whatever that might be, uh, they wake up with words in their mouth and questions on their heart. 
You know what else I found out? Is that in order to survive, babies have to be selfish. How do they get what they want when they're unable or incapable of getting what they need? They cry. And they let us know their needs. Well, him as a four-year-old, is he's not able to get some of the things he needs, so he asks questions. What is amazing is, just like you and I, he has things that he really likes and things that he doesn't like. He makes things pretty clear, too. Now, we happen to stumble upon this shared interest we have in the movie Moana. Has anyone ever seen the movie Moana? Some of you have? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a really neat show, and in there, there's some great music, and there's one song called Shiny. And it came on Alexa, and his ears perked up, and all of a sudden, this, co- this kid starts singing verbatim almost every lyric of Shiny. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> the power of music in some way, Right? And, and, and he starts singing, and some of the words he kind of creates because he doesn't know quite what they are. But as soon as it goes off, you know what he says? Let's play it again. <laughs> Do it again. I want to listen to that again. So he played it again. And he said, no, you, you sing with me too. And, and then he's like, we're going to start, and he'll start right in the middle of the song because that's his favorite part. No, no, you sing with me. And if you don't say the words how he sees them, he corrects you quickly. <laughs> because he wants it done in the right way. It has to be done in a certain way. So he sings, and it is constant. We had to tell him that the song was banned for a short period of time just to stop it from Alexa just playing repeat because there is no things that tire him out. He he has no no worries about it getting old. He loves it. And and when we were on this road trip, um, you know what? I feel like I should show you. Check this out. This is what this is a small sample of what life has been like uh, on repeat in my house this week. Chasing the love for me, who made you feel wanted. You tried to jump, but your arm was just like hard enough. No way. No, it's got to keep your heart in. Never seen you so much. I said, you're going to have a bath. 
Because you need a bath. You don't know that you need a bath, but you need a bath. You, you're, tell, you're going to have a bath. So I said, all right, Chase, I understand you don't want a bath. I hear that you don't want a bath, but you need a bath. We're going to take a bath. I don't want to. That's all I said. So I did what every guy did. I put him in the bath. <laughs> I pick him up, and I quickly realize that I underestimated how strong this four-year-old is. He stiffens up, and he stops up. He's like, I don't want to, and he's air stomping still. <laughs> stomping. I don't want to. At this point, I wonder what Stacy's thinking downstairs as she's entrusted me with this task, if she's uh, questioning that decision. So if I said, Chase, I understand that, but you're going to check out these bubbles because I remember my kids. I could distract them and divert them and point them and, and get them to do what they wanted. Look at these bubbles. I try to make a beard out of the bubbles, you know, the cool dad stuff. I don't want to. And he stood up. My heart is swelling inside of me as my own pride and ego and saying, listen, my authority is being questioned here. I said, Chase, listen, uh, I, I, I love you. I care for you. I'm, I'm, your, I'm, I'm kind of your, your parent this week, and I'm telling you that you're going to have a bath. You need a bath. You're going to have a bath. You know what I said? You're right. Logically and rationally, that makes a lot of sense. I hear what you say. I submit to your authority. I now will take a bath. No, I don't want to. So I said, okay. I grabbed the bucket, and I just dumped the water on top of his head. I don't want to. I said, I hear you, Chase. I know you don't want to, but we need to. We'll make this fast. I don't want to. I take him out of the tub. I drive off. I don't want to. I said, Chase, you don't want to want. The bath is over. It's done. There's, there's nothing else not to want. You're, you're almost done. I don't want to. I get him dressed. I take him to the other room. I get him his stuff. And he's still stopping and telling me, I don't want to. There's something inside of us all oh, that has these preferences that we want. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when the thing that we didn't want has passed, we can still hang on to it because of something. It's human. It's inside all of us. You have preferences. I have preferences. Every person walking has preferences, and that's not a bad thing. It's okay to have preferences, but there are moments and points in times when we take them to a place where it becomes a problem. <laughs> When the world starts revolving around what I want, how I want it, when I want it, because I deserve it, because that's how it should be, this dangerous ground is not just for me, but for you, but for all of us, interacting. And we're going to look at that today, and we're going to understand that there's, there's important things. Because at the, at the end of the day, there is wisdom to asking yourselves and taking inventory from time to time about why you do what you do and how you invest your time and how you fill your schedule and how you're stewarding the things that God has given you. And it is important to make sure that you're doing things that are honoring to your core beliefs uh, for us and what Christ has told us to be. Now here's the thing we've talked about uh, for around here over and over and over. There, there are essential things that we need to have unity on. Primary things that we stand on and say, okay, that's the hill we're willing to die on. We usually don't have a problem with this section. That's that Jesus is the way, that the Bible is the inerrant truth of God, the word of God given, that, that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died, rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father. That scripture is uh, the way for us. We, we have unity on those things. That there's no other way to, to salvation but through Jesus, right? There's unity things, primary things. We're willing to die on those hill things. But the majority of the strife we have comes in this secondary thing, the how we do things. The way that we sing, the way that we interact, the, the music that we play, the classes that we do, the, the things that we engage in, the mission opportunities, where we send finances. Uh, those are the, the secondary things that quickly can get elevated to what feels like a primary thing. So as we come into this time, we understand that human nature, our earthly nature, is something that we will fight every single day for the rest of our lives. You never will grow out of your earthly nature attacking you, wanting you, wanting a place in your life, wanting to take things that are secondary and make them and elevate them to primary things. Satan has a field day. Churches have been ripped down the middle over the color of the carpet and the, and the carpet and the drapes. True. Over things that are insignificant, that are secondary, that at the end of the day, we've said it around here, my, my grandfather told me it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. We elevate them. It's human. We've got to recognize, though, the Bible is filled with people and their preferences. It's also filled with people who compare themselves to others, because that's where this goes, right? Chase didn't want to, I don't want to, or I want to do this. 
And you compare around and you see how everyone else is getting what seemingly they want, and I think I deserve to have it my way too. Well, let's go right back to the very beginning of the Bible. Think about Adam and Eve. It doesn't get much more clear than God saying, uh, you, all of this is yours, just don't touch that one. But what was the trick that Satan said? Did he really say that? He's holding out on you. It's because he doesn't want you to be like it. There was a lie. They believed it. And they elevated a secondary option to a primary thing. Now, if you ever wondered about your own parenting or grandparenting skills, I would say uh, scripture is a reinforcement that we are all uh, challenged with this. Adam and Eve had kids. And in Genesis 4, we see this comparison game continue that was started there. Cain and Abel. That they had different gifts, different talents. One had flocks, one had grains and garden stuff. And they bring these sacrifices to the Lord in Genesis 4. Here's what it says. Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Now, if you know how the story ends, you understand that what was swelling up in Cain when he was uh, maybe didn't get what he thought he deserved was taken out on his brother Abel. Ugly things swirl up inside of us when we start playing the comparison game, when we think about the things that we want when we don't get them, and we decide that in our own ways, we're going to start our foot saying, I don't want that. What am I way? It's not just you, it's me. It's human nature. It's in us. That's why Paul would tell us to put to death your earthly nature, because it's ugly. Do you have ugly in you? Do you have moments where you desire and want things? Things that aren't necessarily good. Or do you ever look around and you see what others have and, and think that you should have them? Do you have a hard time celebrating with people when they're going well because you think, why don't I have that? Why can't I get a part of that? I, I've worked hard. I deserve that. There's this cliff that, that balances between a healthy evaluation of our lives and the things that we want and the things that we chase after and the things that we do but when we tip over what is waiting, what's crouching at our door is nothing less than just sin, envy, anger, covet, jealousy, anxiety. Those things are there, lurking, and Satan has a field day. He distracts you from the truth with these secondary issues to keep you away from your primary mission of advancing God's kingdom and pointing to Christ. It causes division where there shouldn't be. It's because of what swells inside of us. So when we think about our scripture, when we were with you, when I was with you two weeks ago, we left off with this rich young ruler who had, had an option given to him by, by Jesus. You've done things right. Go sell all you have and follow me. Do you remember what he said? No, oh, thank you. He declined. But Peter and the disciples said, well, we're going to be saved then. But do you remember what else Peter said? Here's what Peter said. Let me give you a refresher course. Uh, Peter answered him, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? What's in it for me? I took you up on the offer. I did things the right way. I, 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 me, me, me. What do I get out of this? And Jesus gives them this understanding that something, not here, but there. Why does he tell you? Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. What an odd thing to end with. Peter, you're asking what's in it for you? Here's what's in it for you, Peter. Um, some great stuff is waiting. Oh, that's not what Peter was saying. What's in it for us? Now, what do I get? I'm invested in this. And Jesus ends with, he were first will be last, and many were last will be first. What? You see, context matters a whole lot. Uh, who he's talking to in the setting of the time matters. Uh, context and text are, are not something we can separate. Uh, Jesus looks at Peter and says, the first will be last, and last will be first. Well, Peter's asking the question, why would he say that to Peter? In Matthew 4, you get a hint about this. Do you remember this? 
The subheading of that section is Jesus calls his first disciples. Well, how's that go? In 18 through 20, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. The first disciples that Jesus has, po has chosen is who? Peter. And now Jesus is telling the first will be last and the last will be first. Well, how's Peter respond? He, he, he answers the call. He leaves his livelihood. He leaves all the things he's invested in, spent time in, was trained in, all the things he had worked for for himself to advance himself and his kingdom. He leaves on the shores by that lake to follow Jesus. That's what he does. Now he's asking, what about us? Three years he walked beside Jesus. And the fruit of that is a man who is still struggling with his earthly nature. Don't be surprised when you still struggle with your earthly nature. It's human. It's vicious. Who was Peter? Who was this guy? He was bold. Remember we talked about this? Bold but anxious. He, he was one who was willing to step out of a boat. But the what ifs got him. He, he was asked by a teenager, hey, don't, weren't you with Jesus? Don't <coughs> not me. Bold but anxious. What about Peter? Faithful but fearful. He, he would leave behind everything to follow Jesus, but then there's moments like, well, what's in it for me? What, what am I going to get out of this? No, Jesus, you, you can't go and be killed. I won't let that happen. I'm going to cut off this guy's ear when he tries to arrest you. He's afraid. There's also a part of him that sees himself as invested and entitled. The two coexist. Here we are walking dichotomous. Inside of us, swell these things we want to do, and then there's things that we do that we don't want to do. All of us are going to go through this. The moment we try to pretend that we don't, we are liars. And the truth's not in us, is what Scripture says. So the sooner we get comfortable with the fact that we're broken, that we need a Savior, the sooner we can turn to the one who can put us back together again. But Peter here is invested. He's been following Jesus. He's left behind things. And now he thinks that there should be something that comes along with it. Or else, why do you ask the question? What's in it for us? You would think of any person who has ever walked the world, the ones who walked daily with Jesus, slept beside him, listened to him, saw him, would know the answers to some of these questions. It's not like Jesus was quiet about the subject. See, Peter is us. He's human. He's wrestling with the things that are going on inside, the comparison of others around what they've done versus what he's done, and they're therefore what it entitles him to. It's human nature. You ever do that? You ever feel wrong because someone didn't acknowledge how much you've done for them? So the question then becomes, is, well, what are you doing? Peter, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And, and just in case that wasn't clear enough, Jesus jumps into Matthew chapter 20. The very next section, he goes into the story about what the kingdom of heaven will be like, just in case Peter missed the clarity of what he was saying. If you have your Bibles, Matthew 20 is where we're going to be for a little while here. Uh, as Steve read for us, Jesus jumps immediately into this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever's right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around, and he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. Now it's important to know that when Jesus tells this story, there is a very vivid and clear idea of what's going on in the mind of those who's hearing it. Who is he telling this story to? He's, this is not the Sermon on the Mount where he's speaking to groups of people. He is speaking directly to Peter and the other disciples right now. Context, right? And they would have understood what he meant. See, the Jewish day was broken up from 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening. We've got the hours of the day. And all along the way, we have different breaks of fun. And this, this story has this owner going out at the beginning of the day and then looking for workers. Right? So, so let's just take a look at the workers themselves. Uh, let, let's look at what Scripture says, because there is a subtle difference in here that makes a huge difference in the story at the end of this. The first ones, down in verses 1 and 2. 
Even when heaven's like a landowner who went out on early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard, he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. I need you to picture a labor exchange here. People who were wanting work would come to this common area, very well known for the Jews at that time, looking for anyone who had something for them to do. Uh, they were the people who were dependent on a daily wage so their family could eat, so they could survive. They didn't get paid every two weeks. The Mosaic Law said pay them every day. Well, one denarius was a common, uh, common thought to be the, the, the correct pay for one day. So they would come there as early as possible because there were many workers and few jobs. And this landowner uh, hired this specific group of people to go and work for one denarius. They agreed. So what do we got? We got a searching landowner, a searching workforce, an offer made, offer accepted, work started. Pretty clear, right? If we go on to the others, the others who were hired by him. So the work gets going at 6 in the morning, as close as that is possible. By 9 in the morning, he's out looking for more. So what's that look like? Let's see if you can catch the subtle difference. Let's see if you can catch it. Pay attention again. About 9 in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around, and he asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. Did you catch the difference? Subtle difference. Very subtle difference. Now, some of you might be sitting here thinking, um, these guys are lazy. What, what? They've been standing there all day long? No work? I mean, this, this owner asked the question, right? Why are you standing here all day? Because no one's hired them. See, it's not that they're lazy. It's quite the opposite, actually. They're devoted. Uh, they are passionate about finding work. They're still there because there hasn't been the opportunity for them yet. Others have came. Others have been hired. Yet they still remain. And they're holding on to hope that someone somehow could get them something. So maybe the people depending on them can have some income. <clears throat> I mean, these are faithful men. Women who, who are longing just to, to work. So he goes through. And, and this owner is still searching. We have a searching landowner, a searching workforce, an offer made, an offer accepted, and work started. Now this landowner, let's think about him for a second. This landowner, this would have happened about the harvest time where it was crucial. The harvest had to be brought in or else the whole crop would be lost. So he was with a sense of urgency looking for people to find, to put them to work because time was coming where it would be too late. So he goes in at various times of the day. Did you catch the last one at 5 o'clock? That is an hour before the closing bell. He's still out searching right up to the very end. But did you catch the subtle difference? The first ones were offered a contract saying, you work, I'll pay you uh, for one. One denarius. What do you say to them? I'll pay you what's right. And based off of the goodwill and the belief of the landowner and the thought that something is better than nothing, they go and they work. So the story continues. We have the workers working. They put in a good day's work. And in verse 8 happens, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. It's not coincidence. It's not ironic. It's very intentional what Jesus is doing here. He's setting up the last and the first, the first and the last of what's going on. And he's setting the stage for what that is. Some of them have been there since 6 in the morning, working all day. Some of them got there at 9, at noon, at 3, at 5. And they're all there, shoulder to shoulder, getting ready to be paid. Can you imagine what's going through their minds right now? What would be going through your mind if you were hired at 6 in the morning, contracted to do a job, and you watched constantly as other people came in throughout the day to start the work later than what you did? What would be going through your mind when it came time for payday? Human nature. Earthly nature swells up inside of us. Our minds start to jump to places quickly. Reason happens, right? What do they deserve? Well, who gets to decide what these workers deserve? Well, the truth is that each one of these workers is deciding in their own minds what they think they deserve, what they think should happen. You ever have in your mind what you think should happen? What you think someone deserves? What you think the course of action should be? It's so clear to you from your own experiences. I've been there. I've done that. 
verses 9 and 10. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Human nature. Earthly nature. They see these guys coming in at five o'clock. They worked for one hour and they got a denarius. We've been here since six in the morning. They start licking their chops. Oh, this is going to be great. Can you imagine what these other guys were thinking that it came in at various times of the day? What would you be thinking as you just witnessed the owner give this guy who came in and only worked an hour the same? But each one of them also received a denarius. The first and the last received the same thing. And much like our little friend in the bathtub, I submit to your authority. That sounds like a fair and honest, good decision. I will humbly accept that and take my denarius and, and uh, click my heels and go home. No, nope. not what happens. They take it personal. The, their minds, when they heard what the people who, who came in and worked for an hour got, they got so excited because they thought, cha-ching, baby. I earned it. I deserve it. It's mine. It's going to be great. And then as soon as they got what they had agreed to, came out. Something ugly came out. They take it personal. And in verses 11 and 12, when they receive it, they begin to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. How dare you? How dare you treat them the same as me? I've been out here since six in the morning, sweating and just busting it. And they come in for an hour and you're going to give them the same? I deserve better than that. Who do you think they are? Who do you think you are? How can you disrespect me that way? They grumble. When's the last time you grumbled? When's the last time the things swelled up in you that caused you to think, I deserve better than this? Maybe it was a situation where you're right. I don't know. Lots of things come up that cause us to feel that way. But if we don't evaluate them and ask questions about them, we will work out of them as though they're always true. So they grumble. They're not quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to anger. They quick, quickly talk. They're quickly mad. We have a problem. They start screaming what little kids scream. It's not fair. It's not fair. Less work doesn't equal same pay. Our world tells us that if you work hard, you put in the time, we're going to compensate you fairly for that. The more time and talent you have, the more you're compensated. It's in the contract. It should be known that way. I mean, this is unearned and unmerited. There is no way that this should be happening, landowner. What, what's wrong with you? I mean, seriously, what kind of owner does this? You ever scratch your head at the decisions others make? You ever done that? You said, what kind of person thinks like this? The landowner responds. And he responds in a way that I think maybe they weren't ready for or expecting. Remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples. The context matters. He's aiming this directly at Peter at this point. But he answered one of them. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? If you want to trace back the things that swell inside of you that are ugly, you will almost always find pride and selfishness at the root of them. The things that you want, the things that you desire, the things that you think that should be and ought to be are driving them. The question is, is what does the landowner want? What is it that he's called us to do and wants for us to have? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? He was fair to them. They had a contract. They agreed to it. They worked it out. He paid them what he offered them. He also paid them what he thought was right. Because it was his. It's all his. The vineyard was his. The, The income was his. The money was his. It all belonged to the one who was searching for the workers to start with. What kind of owner does this? Unmerited, un, unearned things. It's a very gracious and a very generous one. The unmerited favor of God. You know what that means? It means that you can't earn it. It means that you could bust your tail all the days of your life and still fall short. 
that God has given us the greatest gift in his son, and we never earned it or deserved it, but he gave it. And in this case, if Peter was the first, and he's been invested since the very beginning, and he's going to bring in and see other people come in right at the very end, the reward will be the same because the owner is gracious and generous. So why don't you live content with a generous God who doesn't play by the earthly rules of what we consider to be fair. He plays by his own standard of what is right. Because it's all his. Context matters. Peter, here is the disciple, who is the rock that Jesus is going to build the church on. And he's struggling with this. Uh, why wouldn't we expect to struggle with these ideas too? The problem is, is we let them run unfettered, unchecked, and we don't hold these things captive to Christ and look to kill them daily. It causes problems. Problems in your families. Problems in your marriages. Problems in your relationships. Problems in churches. Problems in businesses. Problems in communities. Problems in nations. Problems in the world. See that playing out? Sure it does. The very last thing he says is where he left off in Matthew 19. So Peter, the last will be first, and the first will be last. What do we take away? What do we take away from this? First of all, we start off that we have a very generous and grace-giving Father who, who owed us nothing, yet has given us everything through his Son. We take away the fact that inside of us is an earthly nature that thinks that we are entitled to deserve things. And when it doesn't go the way that we think it needs to, we can kick and stop and throw fits over things that are secondary. We can compare ourselves to others and say, that's not fair, that's not right. It's the wrong questions. It's not a matter of fairness in God's economy. The question is, what's God giving? What are we doing with what God's giving? It's takeaways. What else do we take away from this moment? That envy is crouching at your door. It is wise to ask questions about how are you using your time and the things that you want. There is okay to have preferences. But be aware that what is crouching at your door is something that is deceptive. A fine sign of argument that says you deserve to have it your way. You've been going to that church for so long, they should have to listen to whatever you say. You've been, you've been doing that for so long that... that you're where the highway. I, I, I've, I've seen in my own life these things that swell up inside of me. I have preferences too. And what I've come to find out is like at the end of the day, our prayer that was modeled to us at the beginning of this Alive and Growing series was, your will be done, your kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's all his. Anything that you've been given, anything that you feel like you've earned, uh, how have you done that? By the abilities to learn and to, to figure things out that was God-given, God-granted, partnering with him. So when we come and we lay everything down at his feet and we take away the comparison game, we strip down our pride and our ego and sometimes even willing to bear with one another who have different preferences. It's the hardest thing about being a body of believers, a family, is that all of us have preferences over the secondary things. I bet some of you would love to have red carpet. Some would love to have blue carpet. And some would rather have a coffee. Some would rather have tea. Some would rather have a Snickers for Halloween. And some would rather have a Skittles. What do you have, sweet tarts? Smarties. Smarties. It's an awful choice. <laughs> we have preferences, and that's okay. And, and sometimes what we do when we bear with one another is we realize that we're not always going to have it our way. So we go forth and we, we see what is the beauty of it as we walk through it. We eat the Smarties sometimes and we just choose to say no thank you. Because we realize that the type of candy is secondary. The fact that we are sharing our candy is primary. We worship, that's primary. We worship God in our words and our deeds and our giving and our, and our actions and our, and our singing and all the things that the, that's primary. How we do that becomes secondary. And there's going to be times where you walk out of here thinking, yeah, not my favorite songs. There's going to be some times where you're on cloud nine. And what's the truth is, is that for someone else sitting in this room, the opposite is true. In those moments, I want to challenge you to find how to worship by saying, God, what are the words? What's the doctrine? What's the things being said? And the actions that we go forth, we uh, have a lot of just figuring out life together. 
and seeing how we move forward with the mission that we left. Do you realize that Sundays are a small part of who we are and what we do? That the majority of our work is done through the rest of the week? That our mission here as a body of believers is not to have a cool little setting here where we come and we sing songs and we dress up and we look nice, you have cool masks on, you look very festive. We could do that, but that's not the point. The point is that this is a launching pad into mission that Jesus left for us. To go into the world to evangelize the lost, to disciple believers, to do all that he's commanded us to do. All in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is our mission. And what Satan wants to do is to get us focused on secondary things. That when we are on our deathbed, will not amount to a hill of beans. Not wrong. It's okay to have preferences. We need to bear with one another on all sides of this throughout all that we're doing. We need to go forward hand in hand in unity for the cause of Christ because we realize of what he's given to us. If you're here and you've accepted Christ, what else do you need? What else do you need? If you're here and you have not accepted Christ, what are you looking for? What's that working out? Christ is enough. The gift of salvation is more than we deserve. Because the truth is, is that God's not concerned about being fair. If he was, do you know what the wages of sin are? Death. Jesus looked down upon this world. He said, that's not right. My children have strayed. They've broken the commitment. They deserve to be separated from me forever. But I'm not willing to do that. You know what wasn't fair? He asked Jesus to step into our place. You want to talk about not fair? Jesus, you're perfect. You're my son. You've done nothing wrong. Everything right. You are worthy. Will you go and take their place? It's not fair. It should be our cross. What's Jesus do? Yes. I will. When you experience a love like that, a trade like that. Your life and your priorities and your perspective must change from not what I want to what he wants. We become second. We seek him in all that we do. Is it easy? No. It's simple to read, simple to go through the scripture and see, but is, is it easy? No. That's why every day we walk together. We stay together, we pray together, we grow together, we fall together, we get back up together, and we get on mission together. Because the stakes are high. Life is short, and eternity is long. Do the things that the landlord says that matters. Can you pray with me? Father, we come today humble. Because I know in myself I have preferences, the way that I wish things could be. And I know that inside of all of us, we have those things. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment to see them, to know which ones that we should pursue, which ones we need to have conversations about, and which ones are the moments we need to just bear with one another. God, we don't know the answers to all of those. But I pray that as we go through into the future, Father, you would give us wisdom and unity and discernment to do what you have us to do, because all of this is yours. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a part of what you're doing in this community. I pray that you would give us favor with, with the lost world around us, God, that we would be able to be ambassadors for who you are, that we can find ways not just to meet on Sundays and a few other times, but to be engaged in your mission. God, and I know it's a weird world right now, and I pray that you would reveal to us how to do it in 2020. How do we do that even now, God? I pray that you would put a burden on our hearts. And not for secondary things, but to reach the lost, to disciple believers, all for your glory. God, you've been so good to us. You've been unfair to us. We don't deserve the goodness that you've given. We don't deserve this land that we live in. We don't deserve the beauty of this earth. We don't, believe, we don't deserve the creation that you've made. Yet you say that we do. That you give these things to us because you are good. You're gracious. God, what a what a way, what a thing to lay our lives down to. There's nothing that compares to you. There's nothing, God, in those moments when we lose sight and we want to focus on things that would take us to paths of division. Help us to find the call of you in unity. 
Help us to bear with one another. Help us to submit to one another as we go forward. Help us to see the good in what you've called good. I pray for those who are here today who are struggling in life. Maybe they struggle with comparison. Maybe they struggle with their situations or circumstances in life. Maybe they feel like they've been dealt an unfair hand. God, I pray that they would see the truth about who you are. That you've never left them. That you've never been surprised by the things that are going on. But that you use all of those things as tools in your hand. Well, the master craftsman to reveal the truth about ourselves and our need for you. Thank you for that. I thank you that we can celebrate because you've overcome the world. Not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. I pray these things in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand up with us as we sing. We, we sing songs of celebration at the end because Jesus has overcome the world, because uh, of what he has done. We celebrate. We celebrate lives cleaned by this flowing river. Let's sing. Is it primary or is it secondary? It really matters. Is it worth dying over? Is it something that 
It's something I just really want instead of those things. I have to do it all the time myself because we all have them. We will all continue to have them. So with that said, I want to give you your benediction for the day. Go forth into this world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Do not return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Guard the dignity of all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. The very first chance that you get to think about this is you can consider uh, when the preacher went long-winded, is that a primary or secondary thing for you to work on? <laughs> Have a great week. We'll look forward to seeing you soon.